Our key passage for this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. So if you want to turn there, uh, we're continuing on the theme of giving that Luke began in his last week's message. And we'll be looking at God's instruction for giving in the current age or the church age. So 2 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 6, says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I just love it when God tells us what the point is nice and plain so we can't mess it up. Um, you, get, you can't get much plainer than this. The uh, biblical principle of sowing and reaping. And that's exactly what it is. It's a principle. And a principle is just that. It's a general rule that, in this case, explains a cause and effect action. If you, uh, if you sow sparingly, then you will reap sparingly, and if you sow plentifully, you will reap plentifully. So if you go out and till up an acre of garden, and you take one handful of seed out of wheat and cast it on that garden, you're going to get a handful of wheat. But if you go out and broadcast seed on that whole acre, barring any catastrophe, you'll wind up with an acre's worth of standing wheat. So, uh, once again, this is a general principle, and what I'm not telling you this morning is that if you sow your hard-earned money into this ministry, the Bible says that God will provide you with a bountiful return of riches. That is not what I'm saying. Do not mistake a biblical principle for a bogus promise of financial prosperity. That's not how it works. That's not what this scripture is telling us. But the general principle is, if you sow a little, you get a little, and if you sow a lot, you'll reap a lot. Paul was speaking specifically of an offering that he was collecting for the needs of the church in Jerusalem. They had fallen on hard times after Acts chapter 2, and they had a lot of people and not a lot of resources. And so Paul was going throughout uh, Macedonia and all the regions where he ministered and was taking up a collection for the church in Jerusalem. But more importantly, 2 Corinthians gives us the model for New Testament or church age giving, and it begins with the principle of sowing and reaping. So how we sow determines how we reap, and that goes for everything we do. And it has everything to do with our relationship with God. It is a gauge of our spiritual walk. It measures our maturity, our faith, our gratitude, our obedience, our servanthood, and our stewardship. And these are all important factors in our walk with God. Verse 7 goes on to say, Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now Luke touched on this last week, and I love how he pointed out the the implied message that if you give grudgingly, if you don't give cheerfully, then God doesn't love that, and uh, he's not going to be pleased. But this really gets to the heart of the issue, and that is the heart of the believer. In every circumstance, God looks at our hearts, and he knows exactly what's in your heart and my heart, and we cannot fool God. He knows. And if our hearts are set on God, then we'll look for his will and we'll work towards doing his will. If we don't set our hearts on God, then nothing we do is going to satisfy him. And we're going to seek to satisfy our own desires. And you cannot please God that way. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you and I reveal where our heart lies by what we see as treasure. If we see money as treasure, then our heart will pursue money. If we treasure God, then we will be in a heartfelt pursuit for the things of God. If you turn to Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, we can take a deeper look into the matter of giving 
by looking at the, the words Jesus says in this passage, it's Matthew 25, 14. Jesus says, For it will be like a man on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his, money, his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing forth five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Um, he also who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what is yours. But the master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's pretty harsh. So in this parable, Jesus is the man, and we need to understand right from the beginning, he owns everything. That's the first thing that this passage is teaching. God owns everything. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. So everything and everyone belongs to God. He owns it all. The servant in this story represent us. And the master has entrusted his, his possessions into our care. And this means that every single person, both saved and unsaved, is a servant of God. We might think that only the saved are servants, but that's not true. Every person and everything is created for service to God. Some serve willingly and for good, and some serve reluctantly and sometimes with an evil intent. But everybody and everything serves God. The atheist might say, there is no God and I don't serve any God, but the truth is, yes, you do. You might say, I don't believe in the law of gravity, but if you step off a building, you're going to hit the ground. The truth is the truth, and it doesn't matter what you believe. Unwillingness to believe does not change the facts. And everyone serves God. Satan is God's servant. The Babylonians in the Old Testament were God's servants. Unregenerate people are God's servants. And of course, saved people, you and I, are God's servants. And in the end, everybody serves God for his will and his good purpose. That's the whole reason. So God has entrusted his possessions to people, and our stewardship of those possessions determines how much we will, God will entrust to us. The person who is faithful in much will be trusted with more. The person who is faithful with little will be trusted with more. The person who is unfaithful and wasteful 
will not be given anymore. In fact, what he has will be taken away from him. And that person will be cast into utter darkness. This is, this is really gets down to what is our relationship with God. You see, a, a talent is a reference to a large, large sum of money. But this passage really is not about money. It is about our relation with God. It's about stewardship and servanthood and their condition of our relationship with God. So uh, your relationship with God determines how you will handle his possessions. And I want you to notice how I said that. What I didn't say is your, how you handle possessions determines your relationship with God. That's not the case. It's the other way around. Your relationship with God determines how you handle what he entrusts to you. If he is your master and you are his servant, and if he is your Lord and you are his slave, then you realize that he owns everything, and you steward what he has entrusted with you, and you seek his will and his desire in the way you manage his possessions. Remember, servants do not own possessions. Slaves do not own property. They do not have a will of their own. They seek to do the will of their master. That's what servants do. So notice the servants in our story. One faithful servant was given five talents and increased five talents, and the other was given two talents, and he increased two talents. And what this speaks of is various levels of maturity. If you remember, the passage said, as they were able, one was more mature than the other, and he was entrusted with more. As we grow and mature in our faith, we should become more faithful. This is one of the things the Bible is speaking of when it talks about producing fruit. This is how we produce fruit. We mature, we seek God's will, we handle life the way God wants us to handle life. And remember, all of God's children produce fruit. None of God's children do not produce fruit. John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burnt. So the two faithful servants produced fruit because they were in Christ. The unfaithful servant who did not produce fruit was not in Christ. He didn't produce fruit. And just like Jesus said, he was cast into utter darkness. That means hell. He was cast into hell, and he will be burned eventually like a withered branch. So in order to give in a manner that's pleasing to God and acceptable, first, you have to be in Christ. You've got to be his servant. You have to be submitted to his will. Otherwise, you're still going to serve, but you'll never be in a right relationship while you're serving, and instead, you'll try to serve your own interests instead of God's. And don't forget, the faithful servants who produced fruit both received the same reward. They were both given more, and they both entered into the joy of their master. And that's where we want to be. That's our goal, right? Who doesn't Look forward to the day that they will hear, well done, good and faithful servant when they come into God. That should be our primary goal in life. Now you say, I thought this was a message on giving. Well, what we need to understand is this. If we don't grasp this, then we're never going to know how to give right. We're never going to know how to steward God's possessions. If he can't trust us to handle his grace and his faith, then he's never going to trust us with anything more important. And keep in mind, Material possessions are not that important to God. What's really important is the spiritual matters, faith and grace, those types of things. That's what you want to be trusted with. That doesn't mean you won't have material belongings. God gives material belongings to a lot of people that aren't in Christ. Um, but in order to give rightly, you must have, he, he must have, God must have possession of your heart. If not, you're never going to do anything right with his possessions. You'll just do what your evil heart desires. So if we go back to our key passage in 2 Corinthians, it says each, month, each one must give 
as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So to be acceptable, the offer must be given with a free heart. It's up to you to decide what you're going to give. Then without reluctance, that means that you're ready and willing to give. And then what? Next it says, not under compulsion. So what does that mean? It means you give without having to be told to. Okay? And that brings us to the tithe. First of all, the, the word tithe means one-tenth. A lot of us think of it as 10%. And we first see it in Genesis, uh, in the story where Abraham went to rescue his nephew Lot, who had been kidnapped, and he defeats the king, kings who had taken him. And when Abraham comes back, he gives one-tenth of the spoil that he took from those kings and gives it to Melchizedek, the king priest. But later in the Old Testament, the tithe is actually prescribed. Um, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Israelites are told, they're actually required to take one-tenth of everything they produce, their crops, their livestock, and everything that they produce, and to consecrate it to God. And then in Numbers 18, that tithe is set aside for the Levites because they don't have a means of support and they don't have any inheritance. So God says, set that aside for the Levites. So that's the first tithe. The next one is, uh, still in Deuteronomy, a second 10% that's set aside to provide for the feasts. So that there will be animals and produce and wine and oil available for the offerings when the people come to Jerusalem for the prescribed feast that God has called them to observe. So that's a second 10%. Now we're up to 20%. And then there was a third 10th taken every third year and set aside for the poor, for widows and orphans and travelers and Levites that might be living in your town that had needs. So now we're up to 23%. And that was what was required of the children of Israel. But those tithes were a tax. So they were compelled to give those tithes. And giving, this, this is what it means when it says giving under compulsion. They were required to do it. It was not free will. It was not of a free heart. And by the way, they were not very consistent in that. God really needed some IRS agents to go collect off the Israelites because they were not notorious for paying their tithes. Fortunately, this is one of the ways that Jesus uh, fulfilled the law for us. The tithe is not really a New Testament concept. When the New Testament has the opportunity, it really doesn't teach tithing. As a matter of fact, it's mentioned a couple of times in the Gospels and a little bit in Hebrews, but it's never prescribed as the, uh, as the church age manner of giving. That's not what the Bible calls us out to do. And that brings us back to our key passage. Each one must, must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there's only one way to be a cheerful giver, and that's if it is the desire of your heart to give. So giving for us is a free will offering. Each believer is to determine in their own heart what they will give. When we take up our offering, offering, a lot of times we call it our tithes, but that's really not accurate because we aren't under the tithe, although some people do still give 10%. And like Luke said last week, there's nothing wrong with that. 10% is a good place to start. Honestly, if you can put 10% away for giving and 10% in savings and live on 80%, that's a good basic model for life. But Giving can't be based on a percentage all the time. You may have to give more. You may be able to give less, less sometimes. It's a free will offering. But we are not commanded to tithe. I think a lot of people still tithe because they just that's what they've been taught to do. I think that a lot of people, pastors, and teachers teach tithing because they just haven't come to the realization that it's an Old Testament concept that really doesn't carry over into the New Testament. Um, but I think the, the biggest reason that a lot of these pastors teach tithing is because they're trying to get people to give more generously than what they do. Um, I checked the uh, church statistics, and the average church attender who professes to be a Christian in America, according to the researchers, give 
and that's been the number for decades. I've looked at this throughout the last couple of decades, and it's always been 2%. So it's not a total surprise that some preachers might be compelled to teach tithing just to try to get some more funds in their, in their coffers. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to teach what the Bible teaches, and we need to teach proper principles on giving, and that's what we're going to do. So the only way that we grow and mature as Christians is do what the Bible says, not what somebody coerces us into doing. So that's not what we're going to do. The, the principle of the free will offering was prescribed in Deuteronomy chapter 16. In verse 10, it says uh, it, this was the Feast of Weeks. It says, Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to your Lord, your God, with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give the Lord as, as the Lord your God blesses you. So the first principle of the free will offering is right there at the end of the verse, as the Lord your God blesses you. This means that your giving should be proportionate. In other words, if you've been blessed much, you should give much. If you've been blessed a little, you know, a little more is appropriate, or a little less is appropriate. But it should be proportionate to how you've been blessed by God. Now, don't look at this like it's some opportunity to gain God. That's not going to work. Don't think, well, I'll give a lot in order to get a lot. Don't forget, God looks at your heart. He's going to catch it. James says, uh, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. If you think that you can give God a lot just to get a lot, then you're given with the wrong motive and the wrong attitude, and God will not bless that. God is not going to feed greed. He doesn't do that. So here's my, my theory on financial prosperity. God allows financial prosperity to a, re, a person for one of four reasons. One, to teach. Remember the parable of the talents. The servant who had two talents had learned to be faithful. I'm sorry. Yeah. The servant who had two talents had learned to be faithful, and he would be trusted with more. So that's to teach. Number two is because he knows that you're a trusted steward with his possessions. If you remember the uh, servant with five talents, he was trusted with more and more again and will be trusted with more in the future. So that's because he knows he can trust you. The next one is to test. The servant with one talent was tested and he failed. He failed to represent his master and he lost it all. And then the last reason I think that God allows people to have financial prosperity is because he doesn't want them in his kingdom. If you remember, Jesus told the disciples after, after the incident of the rich run, young ruler in Matthew 19, he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. If you remember the illustration of Baal a couple of weeks ago, uh, God gave Baal numerous opportunities to do the right thing. He even made a donkey talk to him. And Balaam just didn't get it. He wouldn't do what was right because God knew Balaam's heart, and Balaam's heart was filled with the love of money. And we all know the love of money is the root of all evil, and Balaam proved that, and his greed consumed him. His lust for money was the end of him. So if you try to use God's principles for greed and lust, it's always going to work against you. And eventually, God's going to let it destroy you, just like he did with Balaam. So the New Testament gives further instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It says, Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church in Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there are no, will be no collection when I come to you. So what that means is giving should be done regularly. In this case, Paul was saying on the first day of the week, which incidentally, by this point, the church had stopped observing the Sabbath and had begun to meet on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. And so Paul was saying, when you come out on the Lord's Day, have some money stored away and be ready to give. So the point is it should be done on a regular, regular schedule, not just when you feel like it and not just when you have a financial windfall, but it should be a regular priority, first priority, 
and it, it should be set aside with the intention of giving. So it needs to be intentional. So proportionately, regularly, what else? This passage uh, also shows us that it was to be given to the church leaders for the work of ministry. In this case, the money was collected and given to Paul, but if you look at Acts chapter 4, verse 34, it says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed as any had need. Now, I know this sounds sort of like a commune, but the verb tense here is present participle which means that it was done on a continual basis. They didn't just take everything and sell it and bring a heap of money in and give it to the apostles. As a person had need, someone who had property might decide to sell in their heart to sell that property and take the money to the apostles to meet the need of the person who had need. So uh, the other issue that that brings out is that we should give sacrificially, not just from our abundance, but to meet the need, even if it discomforts us a little bit, or if it takes away some of our ease and our, our materialism. So that brings us up to the last point, point of giving, and that is it should be done privately. And Luke touched on this slightly last week, Matthew chapter 6. And again, this is Jesus speaking. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to see, be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We don't want man's rewards, we want God's rewards, right? So giving is a private matter to be done quietly and without boasting. Boasting takes the glory from God and steals it for ourselves. So giving is to be done in private. So we go back again to our key verse. Each one must give as he is decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you have all sufficiency in all things at all times. You may abound in every good work as, as it is written. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increasing the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the need of the saints, but also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ in the generosity of your contribution to them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. So, where it says, He has distributed freely, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. That's a quote from Psalm 112, and it speaks of the person who fears the Lord. In other words, this comes out of a relationship and a respect for God. And we remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? But it's also the foundation of a right relationship with God and the basis of true joy and contentment. You don't have true joy and contentment unless you have a right relationship with God. The things of this world may give you a little bit of joy, but it's fleeting. It is not long-lasting. So we give. We give of a free heart without reluctance, without being told we have to. We give because God is generous, and he puts a spirit of generosity in us if we are his. We also give as an act of service. We give as an act of worship. We give regularly, proportionately, generously, and quietly. So here's my last point, and then we're done. Through our giving, God receives glory and thanks. 
So think about this. Why do we work? We work to provide for our families, right? But wait. Philippians 4.19 says that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The passage that we just read said God will provide seed to the sower and bread for food. So that must not be why we work. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says that if you don't work, you shouldn't eat, right? Not really. If you look at our society, we've got a lot of able-bodied people that won't work, and they eat pretty good, so that principle's not holding out. Let's take a look at Ephesians 4.28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Here's the key. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. That's God's perspective. The reason we work is to have something to give to somebody in need so that we can help somebody out. That's what God's looking for. We may not like to believe it, but everything we have is provided by God. Luke hit on this last week. Even if you've got a job and you feel like you've earned it all and, and make it all yourself, God's still the person that created you, created everything that's required to make that job happen, and gave you the ability to do it. It's all a gift from God. None of it comes from us. God provides all of our needs. We may have trouble telling the difference between needs and wants sometimes, but when we give, we're representatives of God, providing His resources as He has provided, as He has dispatched us at His will to serve His providence. We're His hands and feet carrying out His will. We do this is, uh, this is what it means to be spirit-filled. It means to be guided by the Holy Spirit. It means that when God puts it in your heart and you see a need and God says, give to that need, that's being spirit-filled. That's following the Holy Spirit of God. So we give on God's behalf, and that's what mature Christians do. It's just what mature Christians do. And that is the New Testament model for giving. 